In the last couple of sections, we've talked about the exponential function and uh, the natural logarithm function. And in this section, we'd like to talk about exponential functions to bases other than e and the corresponding inverse functions, which will be log to other log for other bases, like log base b. In fact, we don't use logarithms with base with arbitrary bases very much in calculus. We'll see why. And even exponential functions with bases other than e aren't so common for us, but actually do come up more than the logarithm functions. Um, so we have the exponential function, exp, exp of x, so which is e to the x. And we have its inverse function, the natural log of x, which is log base e of x. What we'd like is b to the x, so an arbitrary base raised to the x power. You can either consider this, uh, I've said this in the last two sections, but it, it's still true, that what I'm about to do, you can either take as a theorem, if you already know what it means to raise positive numbers to arbitrary powers, including irrational powers, or you can take it as the definition of what it means to do that, um, either way. So b to the x, well, I should say first, we need, when we're talking about arbitrary real powers, we need for the base to be positive. If um, the base is zero, well, you'd have trouble when x is negative and when x is zero. If, if b is actually negative, then um, when x is, a, is a, even a rational number with an even denominator, you'd be taking even roots of negative numbers. So you don't want that. So you don't want b as 0. You don't want b as negative. So we require b to be greater than 0 when we do this. And then either by definition or by theorem, b to the x. Well, we know that b is e to the natural log of b because b being greater than 0, b is in the domain of natural logarithms, so natural log of b makes sense, and raising e to powers and taking natural log are inverse functions of each other. So this is just b, and then it's raised to the x. Well, but we know properties of raising bases to exponents. e raised to a power, raise that to a power, the exponents multiply. And so you get this, which means if you already know what it means to raise an arbitrary, an arbitrary positive base to an arbitrary power, then it has to be the same as this. If you take it as definition, then you would define b to the x to be this. So whether you take it as definition or theorem, it's this written in terms of x. We are saying that b to the x is e raised to the x times the natural log of b, which is the same as exp of x times the natural log of b. Um, and it's easy from this to find the derivative. So we've got b to the x is e to the x times the natural log of b, or if it looks better to you, exp of x times the natural log of b. We want the derivative, b prime, uh, b raised to the x prime. This is easy for us. It's the chain rule, um, and are not, and combined with our knowledge of the derivatives of x. And you might think you need to know the derivative of natural log. No, b is a constant. We're assuming b is some fixed constant, so natural log of b is a constant. So this is just x times a constant. We don't need to use the derivative of natural log here. You take, by the chain rule, you differentiate the outside function, the exponential function. You leave the inside stuff exactly how it was. But then by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside stuff. This is x times a constant. It's derivative. You just get the constant. So you get, and the derivative of x, well, x is its own derivative. So you get this times the natural log of b. 
But this, this was what, this was b to the x before we rewrote it in terms of e and x. This was b to the x, right? b to the x is e raised to the x times the ln of b. It's the same as this. So this is b to the x times the natural log of b. And this is our formula for the derivative of the general, the exponential function with a general base instead of base e. You, like with e, you get the, you know, the derivative of e to the x, you get e to the x. The derivative of b to the x, you get b to the x, but times the natural log of b. When b is e, when b is e, of course you get e to the x times the natural log of e, but the natural log of e is 1. The natural log of e is just 1, so this agrees with our formula for the derivative of e to the x when you take b to be e, because this is e to the x times 1. All right, so um, it's important for us to know when the natural log of the base is positive and when it's negative, so that we know whether the derivative it's positive or negative. Draw b to the x. b is positive. b to the x. Right? b to the x. In fact, I have said this is a function that you can give it any real number. And it gives you back positive real numbers because e to the x had this property. And we defined it in terms of e to the x. Um, it can give you back any positive real number. Um, but we need to know, since the derivative of b to the x is b to the x times the natural log of b, and we know it's important to know where the derivative is positive and where it's negative, so that we know where this function is increasing, where it's decreasing. This part's positive. This will be positive, negative, or zero, depending on the value of natural log of b. Well, we know the graph of natural log. It looks like this. And so what, what you should know is that, yes, the natural log of 1 is 0. And then if b is, if b is greater than 1, natural log is increasing. So if b, strictly increasing. If b is greater than 1, the natural log of b is greater than 0. When b equals 1, the natural log is 0. And if b is less than 1, if b is less than 1, the natural log of b is some negative, is some negative number. So if b is less than 1, the natural log of b is negative. Okay. So what does this tell us? Well, this case <laughs> is particularly simple. If, if, if your base is b, uh, if your base is b, if b is 1, if your base is 1, then b to the x is a particularly stupid function, or not stupid, particularly trivial. Um, so um, if b equals 1, b to the x is 1 to the x, which is always 1. It's the constant function. It's uh, not a particularly interesting <laughs> exponential function. Um, all right, but if b, what we just saw is if b is greater than 1, the derivative of b to the x is positive because b to the x itself is positive. And now the natural log of b is positive. So this will be greater than 0. And it's easy to calculate the second derivative, too, because the natural log of b is just a constant. So this is just a constant times b to the x. So if you need to differentiate again, just take the second derivative. It's the derivative of the derivative. Derivative of b to the x, you get the b to the x times the natural log of b, and then times this constant. So you get the natural log of b twice. So that's squared. This is positive. This is positive regardless of whether b is greater than 1 or not, um, oh, but as long as b is unequal to 1. So this is greater than 0 if b is unequal to 1. 
course, if b is 1, this is a natural log of 1, that's 0. Yeah, that's b to the x is the constant function 1. Um, but assuming b is not 1, but it is greater than 0, then if b is greater than 1, the derivative of b to the x is positive. So b to the x is an increasing function. If b is less than 1, then of course this is less than 0, and b to the x is a decreasing function. But in either case, where b is greater than 1 or less than 1, but not equal to 1, the second derivative is positive. So <clears throat> it's easy for us to graph b to the x. In fact, qualitatively, if b is greater than 1, the graph of b to the x looks like the graph of e to the x, or at least I can't see the difference. It's increasing concave up. So right now I'm thinking I'm graphing b to the x where b is greater than 1. What does it look like? Well, qualitatively, it looks like the graph of e to the x. Um, this is y equals b to the x. The, graph, the function is increasing, so the graph goes roughly from the lower left to the upper right. Um, that's because its derivative is positive. Second derivative is positive, it's concave up. When x is 0, you get b to the 0, that's certainly 1. Um, as x heads to negative infinity, you've got something greater than 1 raised to negative powers, which are negative big powers, big in absolute value. So 1 over something huge, right? b to a huge negative number is 1 over b to a huge positive number. That's 1 over something huge. It, gets, it approaches 0, just like e to the x does. As x approaches positive infinity, b to the x approaches infinity. The graph qualitatively looks just like the graph of e to the x. At least I draw them the same. Of course, what changes? Well, I mean, the exact graph does, of course, change. Like when x is 1, you should get b to the 1. So you should get b, So depending on what your base is. So of course, the graph isn't exactly the same, but qualitatively. I draw them the same. That's for b greater than 1. What happens when b is less than 1? Actually, it's easiest for me to, uh, to say this by uh, looking at an example. Let's look at, let's look at y equals 2 to the x, and y equals 1 half to the x. So as an example, let's look at y equals 2 to the x. Well, 2 is greater than 1. Qualitatively, this graph looks like what I just drew. It looks like this. It looks like this. All right. Actually, let me put this here. What does the graph, what about the graph of y equals 1 half to the x? So now this is base 1 half. That's less than 1. Why does that graph look any different? Well, you could write this as 2 to the minus 1 raised to the x, and then the exponents multiply, and you get 2 to the minus x, which means it's the same as y equals 2 to the x, except the x's were replaced by minus x's. What's the effect of that on the graph? Well, you swap the positive x's and the minus x's. What that does to the graph is it flips things around the y-axis. So I'll try to draw this so that it looks symmetric. This would be the graph of y equals 2 to the minus x, which is the same as um, the graph of y equals 1 half raised to the x. So this is typical for, for the, exactly the same reason. Anytime your base is less than 1, this is the kind of thing you get. This is, this is b greater than 1. And b less than 1. This is 
y equals b to the x, but b is less than 1, but still greater than 0. Um, right, and as we saw, the, the derivative for this, the derivative of y prime is b to the x times the natural log of b, and if b is less than 1, the natural log is negative. So, yeah, we get a negative derivative, which should mean the function's decreasing. Yep, we see a decreasing function. It goes roughly from the upper left to the lower right. Still concave up, as we said that it should be. And if you want to throw in where b equals 1 into this picture, it doesn't look like the others so much. But, yeah, when b equals 1, you kind of get, well, you don't kind of get, you exactly get this. This is y equals b to the x if b equals 1. It's just the constant function 1. So you can think of it as the transition between um, b being less than 1 and b being greater than 1. Here's this transition b equals 1 and you get the constant function. Okay. The, there is the question, of course, why would you want to use another base other than e? After all, we can write we can write any function in terms of another base. We can write it in terms of e. You just rewrite 2 as that's e to the natural log of 2. And then it's raised to the x, and then the exponents multiply. So you can easily convert a problem to another base into a problem about e. The question is, why would you, I mean, given that e has such a nice property, it's derivative, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Why would you ever want to do anything in terms of another base? And the answer is that, well, some problems just naturally present themselves in terms of other bases. So why would that be? Well, it's just how problems are described sometimes, the data that's given. So we, we talked about radioactive decay. Um, radioactive decay, you had A of T is the amount of radioactive material. I'm actually not, I'm going to start with this, but I'm actually going to switch to a different um, field in a second. But the amount of radioactive material, I'm just going to say material because I'm going to switch to a different material in a minute. Amount of, well, maybe I'll put in radioactive. Amount of radioactive material at present at time t measured in whatever time units you're interested in the problem and the amount of radioactive material could be in by atoms or kilograms so it could be mass or it could be weight. Um, what we saw is radioactive decay. The rate of change in the amount is proportional to the amount present, and we inserted an explicit minus sign so that this k would, would be positive. Great. And we saw that solutions to this are all of the form a equals, so a is a function of time, equals c e to the minus kt. So we saw this. And in fact, just by plugging in t equals 0, you see that that constant C is actually the initial amount of the material, the amount of material at time zero. So we had this. And this is what happens with radioactive decay, and it's why it's called exponential growth and decay, because for physical reasons, you know that something is increasing or decreasing at a rate proportional to the amount present. And if you actually solve this differential equation, this is what you get. Okay. Um, so what? <laughs> Look, we've got E's. Why would you want another base? Well, because of the way that radioactive decay rates are specified, or actually the, uh, the decay rates of drugs that are, uh, some types of drugs that are given to patients. So this kind of decay doesn't just happen <laughs> for radioactive materials. It's also true, and just to have another context in which calculus comes up. I'd like to look at that instead of radioactive decay, but um, 
some medications that are given to patients like um, decay out of the, the bloodstream, out of the body, at um, an exponential rate. So let me switch to um, A of T equals the amount of digitalis So this is a heart medication, which does decay roughly exponentially. Amount of digitalis in a patient's system, patient's body at time t. Um, and yeah, this also decays exponentially. So at a rate proportional to A. And so it means that the solution to that differential equation is the same. It's, it's of this form. But E to the, this is the same as E to the K to the minus T. Oops, minus T. Or you could put the minus sign inside. But the point is that since K could be anything, or here anything positive, E to the K could be any base greater than 1. And so should you use E, or is it more natural to use other bases? The same, you know, the same thing for radioactive decay. Well, it depends on how data is specified about the rate, um, the rate of radioactive decay. So in a sense, well, not in a sense, but exactly, how, K, how you're given data that enables you to determine K and the normal way to be given decay rates, both for radioactive material and for um, drugs in a patient's body, is you're given the half-life. The half-life of the material. So I'm just going to say material. You can think radioactive decay and radioactive material. Or you can think. Um, quantity of drugs, and so it's, that's what material means there. The half-life of the material. This is the time the time it takes for half of the initial amount of material to remain. And as we'll see in a minute, it's independent of how much you start with. Um, the half, if, if you've got some kind of material that decays exponentially, then you might think, oh, well, it takes half the amount of material to remain. Well, maybe if I start with a different amount of material, this time would be different. No, the point of specifying the half-life, or part of the point, is that it's independent of the initial amount. Regardless of how much you started with, the amount of time it takes half of it to remain, so half of it's gone, is, uh, is the same. So, <clears throat> um, all right. So, I actually know the half-life of digitalis. It's approximately, but we'll assume exactly. Um, so, the half-life of digitalis is 36 hours. Uh, yeah. The half-life of digitalis is 36 hours. And let's, let's assume, let's, let's uh, suppose a patient is given I had to look up a reasonable dosage, is given 250 micrograms. So this is micrograms. Of digitalis. 
my question is how long or how long will it take before only two, 25, so one-tenth as much, 25 micrograms remain in the patient's system. <clears throat> All right, this is the problem that we'd like to look at. Um, why, oh, first of all, that's a question, but why is this, uh, I, I'm using this as an example of why other bases come up. So why is this more natural to do in some base other than base E? After all, I, I gave the solution to the differential equation in terms of E. Well, we'll work this out Kind of two different ways, one where it's blatantly obvious what the formula is and one where you have to do some calculations. So what does it mean to say that the half-life of digitalis is 36 hours? It means every time 36 hours goes by, you have half as much as you had before. So what does that mean? It should mean that the amount of digitalis remaining in the patient's system is whatever the initial amount is, and then you need multiplied times one half for every multiple of 36 hours that goes by. Well, you can just immediately write down what the formula is then. You take A naught, you multiply it times a half, a half raised to what? The time divided by 36. So that every time you take another multiple of, you know, every time another 36 hours have gone by, this goes up by one, and so you multiply by another one half. So this should be the formula. And of course, you can write 1 half as 2 to the minus 1. So if, if you prefer, you can write uh, this as a naught times 2 to the negative t over 36. But you immediately get this. And in our example, the example I'm looking at, in fact, we know that the initial amount is 250. So we would get 250 times two to the minus t over 36. This is micrograms. Um, could you get that using base E? Sure, but why would you want to? The, the data about digitalis, or about drugs in general, is usually specified in terms of a half-life, the decay rate. And the same thing for radioactive material, it's specified in terms of a half-life. So yes, you could do this base E, but why would you want to? If you did this base E, it would look like this. So you would write something like this. And then you would say, ah, the half-life of 36. Well, that means that when t is 36, that when t is 36, I am supposed to, the amount that I have is supposed to be half the initial amount. Um, I am assuming the initial amount is not zero. In our example, it's 250. Assuming the initial amount is not zero, and if it were, how much would you have at time t? Zero. Assuming the initial amount's not zero, um, you divide both sides of this by a naught, and you see that the initial amount disappears from the, from the equation, which is why it's irrelevant what it is. You get this, and then you can take a 36th root of each side, so raise both sides to the 1 36th power. And when you raise something to an exponent, raise it to an e another exponent, the exponents multiply. So raising this to the 1 36th wipes out that 36 and you get is e to the minus k. Oh, so up here where this was e, or a naught e to the minus k to the t, we now know that the e to the minus k would be 1 half raised to the 1 36th, so that this would equal a naught times 1 half to the 1, 30, oh, the 1 over 36 raised to the t, 
And then when you raise an exponent to an exponent, the exponents multiply. Yes, we get the same thing, but you shouldn't have to do this. The problem just naturally comes to you in either base one half or base two. Okay, well that was my main point, but we might as well go ahead and um, find the answer to this uh, and show how you can, even though it naturally occurs with base two, you can still use natural logarithms to get the answer in the end. So we now have that the amount of digitalis in this example is 250 times 2 raised to the negative t over 36. And the question is, how long does it take before there are only 25 micrograms, this is in micrograms, before there are only 25 micrograms left in the patient's system? So you set A equal to 25 and you solve for T. So we need to solve, I'm going to drop the units until the end. T is in hours. Maybe I will write that so that we don't forget because we're given the half-life is 36 hours. So we need to solve 25 equals 250 times 2 to minus T over 36. We need to solve this for T. You divide both sides by 250, so you get 25 over 250. So that, of course, is a tenth equals 2 to the minus t over 36. We would like to solve for t. Um, you apply the natural log to both sides. Why natural log? Well, we could use log base 2, but most calculators have a nice, convenient natural logarithm key. And also, as we'll see in a minute, there's very little, or in a couple of minutes, there's very little point to using other bases for logs. But, um, all right. So you take the natural log of this. Well, how does that help? We know properties of logarithms. The natural log of something, of a base raised to a power, the power comes out as multiplication. This is minus t over 36 times the natural log of 2. And now you solve this for t. So you, and you can rewrite this too. We know the natural log of 1 over something is negative. This is just, you could do this on your calculator just as easily as you can do this. But all right, that's the same as negative, the natural log of 10. So what do we get? We get, in this example, In this example, we get that, so mul multiply both sides of this by minus 1, multiply by 36, and divide by the natural log of 2. You get that t should be 36, 36 times the natural log of 10, divided by the natural log of 2. I'd certainly get out a calculator to do this, except I actually <laughs> have the answer, the approximate answer written down. This is approximately 119.59 hours, um, five days would be 120 hours. So that's about this, this is about five days. So. Almost exactly. All right. That's an example of why you'd want to use another base. It's just, yes, sometimes problems just present themselves in other bases. You could, of course, convert to base E, but unless there's a good reason to do it, you shouldn't need to. All right. I've said that, and then I've also said that for logarithms, it's essentially silly to use other bases. Why is that? Well, so first of all, we need to know that b to the x is an invertible function before we give its inverse a name. 
So y equals b to the x. What we saw is that b prime of x is positive if b is greater than 1. That means that this function is strictly increasing, which means in particular that it's 1 to 1. So b to the x is 1 to 1. And it's invertible, where the domain of the inverse function is taken to be the range of this, which would be um, all positive reals. b prime of x is less than 0 if b is less than 1 and still greater than 0. So this function, that means b to the x in this case, is strictly decreasing. So it's still 1 to 1 and has an inverse. But if b equals 1, then the b to the x is the constant function 1. <laughs> it's, it's very far from 1 to 1. Every value of x gives you the same thing. That function is not invertible. So um, we only make this definition if b is greater than 0 and b is unequal to 1. Definition. Um, the base b. So assume b is greater than 0 and unequal to 1. The base b logarithm log base b of x is the inverse function. Of b raised to the x power. So the domain here is the range of b to the x. So the domain of this function is all the positive real numbers. And the range of this function is the entire real line. You can get anything. So um, graphs of say that. So saying that log base b of x is the inverse function of b to the x means exactly that b raised to the log base b of x for any x for which this makes sense, which means x needs to be greater than 0, that this is just x. This is for x greater than, for all x greater than 0. The, the two functions undo each other. If you do log base b of x and you raise b to that, you get x. In words, log base b of x, it's the exponent that you have to raise b to to get x. Um, and it's also true that if you do b to the x first and then apply log base b, then this has to be x. This is for all x for which this makes sense, which is all real x. That's just because b to the x and log base b are inverse functions. The graph, you know, the graphs of inverse functions. Um, we've, we've talked about this before. If b is greater than 1, so maybe I'll just draw this one. If b is greater than 1, the graph of y equals b to the x qualitatively looks like the graph of y equals e to the x. And we know what the graph of its inverse function looks like. It's supposed to be kind of what you get if you take the line y equals x and rotate this around there. This should go to that. You send the negative y-axis to the negative x. So you grab this and you flip it. So um, right, the graph of logarithm looks like this for b greater than 1. For b, actually. I can draw this one too for b less than 1. Uh, the graph, well, I don't know why my scale changed so much. Let me try that again. So here's y equals b to the x if b is 
less than 1 and greater than 0, you get the graph of its inverse function still by rotating by rotating the graph around around this line um, right so it will so let's see how we can draw this it's uh, what color do I want because it will intersect let's it should do <laughs> it will do this kind of thing right here, it, it intersects right here and has to approach that, and then it has to do that looks pretty good. It has to do that. So here's the graph of y equals b to the x, where b is less than 1 and greater than 0, and here's the graph of log base b of x, so y equals where b is between 0 and 1. Right. Okay, so why did I say that log base b is rarely used? Um, certainly, I mean, we could use it anytime we have other bases other than E, but while it's easy for us to switch to base E for exponential functions, it's even, it's even easier for logarithmic functions, and in fact it's so easy it makes using other logarithms kind of silly. So let me remind you, if you have b to the x, that's E to the natural log of b to the x, which is E to the x times the natural log of b. Great. That's pretty easy. But what's even easier, I'll call it a theorem, but it's almost too easy for this. Log base b of x is the natural log of x divided by the natural log of b. And so its derivative, well, this means it's just 1 over b. In fact, let me all write it that way. Right? understand what this says. It says that this constant, 1 over the natural log of b is a constant. Multiply times natural log of x gives you log base b of x. So the difference between this function and natural log multiplying by a constant. That's so simple that log base b of x is it's so unnecessary to use it that it's very rarely used. Um, and so the derivative is certainly easy to calculate. The derivative of this, of log base b of x, well, you get this constant times the derivative of ln of x, which is 1 over x. So you get 1 over x times the natural log of b. But the point is that all the algebraic properties of log base b, all the derivative properties of log base b, everything you want to know about log base b follows immediately from the fact that, it, that you know the corresponding thing for natural log of x and that log base b of x is just a constant times the natural log of x. Why is this formula true? Why does log base b of x equal the natural log of x divided by the natural log of b? Actually, that's fairly simple. Um, or actually, it's very simple. What does it mean to be log base b of x. Log base b of x, by definition, is what you have to raise b to to get x. So, right. 
That's what it means to be log base b of x. That's what you have to raise b to, to get x. All right, so I want to show that the natural log of x divided by the natural log of b is log base b of x. So what do I need to show? I need to show if I raise b to this thing, I get x back, which would then tell me that in fact, this is log base b of x. I'm actually, there's a kind of subtle point. I have to know that an inverse function exists before that's enough to tell me that this is this inverse function, but we know an inverse function exists. So how do you see what this equals? You rewrite b. b is e to the natural log of b. And then this is raised to the natural log of x over the natural log of b. But when you raise something to an exponent, raise to another exponent, the exponents multiply. So you multiply that times that. The natural log of b's cancel, and you get e to the ln of x. But these are raising e to powers and taking natural log or inverse functions. This is x. So yes, we get that b raised to this is x, but that means that this quantity is log base b of x. So I'm not going to spend um, any, any more time on properties, algebraic properties of log base b. You should have learned those in like a pre-cal course or an algebra course. Also, they're exactly the properties of natural log because all you've done is multiply by a constant. And I'm not going to spend any time on second derivative problems with log base b or any kinds of problem with log base b because we simply don't use them in calculus except to convert from log base b to natural log by this formula. All right. There is one last thing I'd like to do in this section. And it, it's, uh, you may think we already know this, but we don't. Or maybe there are two things I want to do. There's one thing that we really want, and then kind of a, <laughs> a gross generalization of it that will maybe make things seem better to you and might make things seem worse. So first, I want the power rule. The power rule, this is, we've had the power rule, but strictly speaking, we, so, we have only known the power rule where the exponent was a rational number. Um, and we want to know the derivative of x to the p, even if p is allowed to be irrational. And I'm only, when you're allowing arbitrary powers, then you want your base to be um, positive. I, I, I should say, up until now in this section, I've had a, a fixed base and a variable exponent. This is a variable base and a fixed exponent. But the point is, you, the base is now not just e. And so how do you take the derivative of this um, and, and why does the power rule give you something that we're going to get through exponential functions? Well, here's how it goes. You rewrite x as e to the natural log of x. That's x. And this is raised to the p, and we want its derivative. You raise an exponent to an exponent. The exponents multiply. So you get this. This is the derivative of e raised to something. So we use the chain rule. You differentiate the outside function, raising e to powers. The, you just get the e to the power back. The derivative of x is x, but the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So the derivative of e to the mess, you get the e to the mess back, but by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the exponent. p is a constant. Suppose x is greater than 0, and, and I can say this, and p is constant. We're only looking at positive x's, but p is constant. So this is a constant times the derivative of natural log of x. That's just 1 over x. So we get, and you rewrite this. Before we messed it up, this was x to the p. Right? You get e to the natural log of x is x, and then the p stays in the exponent. This is x to the p in this part. You get the p times 1 over x. But then x to the p divided by x, you subtract 1 from the exponent, 
Put the P on the left for aesthetic beauty, and you get P x to the P minus 1. Yes, that's the chain rule. Of course, we've known the chain rule for a while, but first we knew it for natural numbers, then we knew it for integers, then we knew it for rational numbers, so fractions. This is how you get the chain rule for arbitrary real powers. It's by going through derivatives uh, with base e. Um, great. So now we know the chain rule, not the chain rule, the power rule, where the, where the power can be arbitrary. The, the, now, the really last thing I want to say is you might wonder why the power rule and derivatives of exponential functions look so different. So if we, what we've just seen is the derivative of x to the p is p x to the p minus 1. This is if p is constant. And we only do this for x greater than 0. All right. On the other hand, we know that the derivative of b to the x is b to the x times the natural log of b. This is if b is constant, b greater than 0. But these don't look anything alike. <laughs> Here's a, the power rule, the derivative of x to the p, px to the p minus 1. The derivative of b to the x, b to the x times the natural log of b. What's the difference? Well, these are very different kinds of functions. Here, the exponent is fixed, the base is variable. Here, the base is fixed, and the exponent's variable. All right, so in that respect, they're very different functions. But you still might expect there to be some connection between those formulas, and there certainly doesn't seem to be one. By the way, I, I should have said this. This is a, uh, I'll make a dire warning. I'll give you, a, you know, this is absolutely, it's a horrible mistake. This is absolutely unequal to. You know, it's a huge mistake in calculus to think that this function should be treated like this one and somehow apply the power rule to this and get x b to the x minus 1. It's just totally wrong. Um, don't do that. But, okay, yes, a variable base fixed exponent versus a fixed base and a variable exponent. Yes, they're very different functions. Okay, maybe that's the whole explanation for why the derivative formulas look so different. Well, yeah and no. I mean, we can give one formula that includes both cases. It's ugly. What I'm about to do is not worth memorizing, especially since it's so easy to derive. But... <laughs> It will include both of those in one formula. I, I'll say it again, do not. It would be a mistake to memorize. So suppose I've got a function g of x, and it's always greater than 0, or at least for the x's in this problem, it's greater than 0. Then we could look at g to the x. That would be a positive base raised to a power that some other function and I'm going to assume f and g are as differentiable as I need during what I write to make this differentiable. The question is, could we differentiate something this ugly? <laughs> the base doesn't have to be fixed. The exponent doesn't have to be fixed. They, don't, they could be arbitrary functions of x, not just, you know, not just x's. So this would be the most general power exponential rule or exponential power rule, you know, how you deal with everything and somehow yeah, this will include the power rule. The power rule would be where g of x is just x and f of x is constant. The exponential rule would be where uh, g of x is constant and f of x is just x. But we're going to do the completely general case. You might be thinking, ah, this is, we can't, we can't possibly do this. How would you do this? You just rewrite the base in terms of e. This base is e to the natural log of g of x. And since g of x is positive, this is defined. That's the base. And then it's raised to the f of x. And then we need to take the derivative of that. But when you raise a base to an exponent, raise that to an exponent, the exponents multiply. And you get e to the f of x times the natural log of g of x. All right, 
and we have to take the derivative of this. But we know how to take the derivative of e raised to something. You get the e to the something back. So you get the e to the f of x natural log of g of x back. But then by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the exponent. The derivative of the exponent is the derivative of f of x times the natural log of g of x. But now there's product rule and some chain rule, but this is very manageable. This is something we can differentiate, so you do. Um, first, let me say this is, this is what g of x to the f of x looked like before we messed it up. Right, you have e, there's the natural log of g of x, so that g of x ends up in the base times f of x. Right? It's, it's how this looked before we messed it up like this. So this part is just g of x to the f of x again. And what's it multiplied times? The derivative of this. This is the product of two functions, f of x times the natural log of something. So you do the first thing times the derivative of the second, plus the second thing times the derivative of the first. The first thing times the derivative of the second. The derivative of natural log of g of x, you have to do the chain rule. The derivative of natural log, you get 1 over the g of x. But then by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the stuff inside. So times g prime of x. We were doing that in the midst of the product rule. So it was the first thing times the derivative of the second, plus the second thing, the ln of g of x, times the derivative of the first. So plus the g of ln of x times the derivative of the first function, f prime of x. Gross! You know, you're thinking that's completely disgusting. Well, yeah. <laughs> What did you expect? But uh, we can make it look a little better. So what did we just get? We got that the derivative of g of x to the f of x is, and if you simplify this stuff, so for instance, put this f of x over here. Uh, you divided by a g of x. Well, that would subtract 1 from the exponent of g of x raised to the f of x. Then you'd have the g prime of x. Then this part, well, nothing much happens with that. If you rewrite this in its nicest form, you get f of x times g of x raised to the f of x minus 1 power times g prime of x plus g of x raised to the f of x times the natural log of g of x times f prime of x. Absolutely do not memorize this, but look at it. it <laughs> this is a completely general formula. This part contains the power rule computation. We had g of x raised to the f of x. The exponent comes down as multiplication. You subtract one from the exponent. And then by the chain rule, you have to multiply kind of times the derivative of the inside stuff, so times the g prime of x. So you, if you were just thinking of the power rule, you might write just this part. But then here's the part that corresponds to the derivative of an arbitrary base, because you get g of x to the f of x, just like here you get the b of x back again, times the natural log of the base. Here's the natural log of the base, times, and now it's like a chain rule part. It's the derivative of multiplied times the derivative of the function that was in the exponent. So yes, this summation might even be what you would guess that, oh, because you have this when the base is variable and this when the base is constant, somehow you should just add those two things. Well, yeah, we just verified that. I'll say it for a third time. Do not memorize this. It's too complicated. It's easy to derive. Just by rewriting the base in terms of e, you can only memorize so much stuff in a math class. It's better to memorize the simple stuff and rederive the stuff that you can rederive quickly. Okay. In the next, that, this is all I want to say about um, bases other than e. In the next section, we'll have to start in on trigonometric functions, so it'll seem completely different.